Just, just a little context. This has been a dream of Linda's and Len's for a few years, and they're getting trained to lead teams to build beds from scratch here in Ventura County. So some will be given away through James Storehouse and some through uh, kids that reach out and say, hey, I need a bed. So that's going to be fun. You'll hear more about it soon. So praise the Lord, right? It's fun to do something practical. So we have been in a series on Ephesians, and I'm going to, um, I think I'll talk double speed, you know, so we'll just have a, a, a quick sermon today. Uh, but big picture, the first half of Ephesians, chapters 1, 2, 3, is theology and most of it's prayer. The second half, chapters 4, 5, 6, is now what do you do about it? So the fir first is, is kind of the why, and then we're going to get into the what starting today. Somebody, wa somebody once called it this, holy results of heavenly blessings. So if we understand who we are and what Jesus has done, then it turns into a different kind of life. That's what Ephesians is all about. So I want to read this, Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. It's interesting that it's not a command from Paul, but it's an encouragement, and it's almost the same word as paraclete, the encourager. So Paul is saying, I encourage you strongly to live a worthy life. It reminds me of a verse in Hebrews where it, where it says, uh, it, in Hebrews chapter 11, it has the list of all these famous people of the faith. How many of you have read Hebrews 11? Like, you know, so it's like the, the um, who's who of our faith. And then it says, this is interesting, the world was not worthy of them. So I was reading that a couple of years back, um, and, and I was thinking, I, was, I kind of felt called out, because I was like, wait, I feel like the world is worthy of me. I'm not living a life that's not worthy of this place. And people aren't looking at me all inspired like, he doesn't belong here. I belong here. But I want to be more like those he heroes of the faith where I live a life that's worthy of what Jesus has done in my life. And that doesn't mean that I become a monk and, you know, whip myself on the back and all that. It just means I'm inspired. I'm changed by what God has done. So, so how do you live a life that's worthy of the calling? Well, I'm glad you asked, because Paul tells us. He doesn't just say, live a life worthy, good luck. He says, live a life that's worthy, and now I'll tell you how. I'll tell you what that means. So verse 2, by being humble and gentle, by being patient, by bearing with one another in love. Is that hard? Yeah. Is that best? Yeah. Verse 3, by making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then verse 4, by remembering that there's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Remember we were singing that song, You're All I Want? If you have like 12 hopes in your life, you're going to be let down by all kinds of stuff. But if you say, I'm hoping in Jesus, I know he's got the future worked out, that's, that's where our hope needs to be. Then it says in verse 5, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. I love how he's just saying one, 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 focus, focus, focus. And, and literally it, it says, when it says live worthy, it says walk worthy. And the book of Ephesians has this phrase walk seven times. And um, doing comes out of being. It's not, you better do better. You better get in shape. You better act all Christian-y and, and holy. It, it comes out of who you are. We're, we're human beings, not human doings. But sometimes we get that all, we get that all screwed up. So, um, so here's a question. Are you a person that identifies with the world and acts like it? Or are you a person whose identity is already in heaven and then you're kind of leaning into that reality each day and going like, how do I do that? How do I live like, live into who you are? That's worthy. It's not being worthy of this place. It's being worthy of that place. Does that make sense? Len's not here, so I got nobody to say amen. So I'm going to need some amens now and then. Come on. So Ephesians 4.2, literally it says, 
when it, when it talks about be humble, it says be completely humble. This is interesting. It's a new word introduced in the Greek New, uh, new Testament because in Greek, the word for humble or is like a slave or a really weak person. So they had to invent this new word, this little hyphenated thing, that, that means uh, kind of like Jesus giving up your rights in order to be humble. Um, I have met a lot of cocky Christians, and I think that confuses people because if we're to be like Christ, that's kind of the opposite. And, and, and if I'm cocky, I don't understand that God reached down from heaven into my junk, my scum, my sin, and the depth of how far he had to go to raise me up should make me humble and thankful, not cocky and judgmental. Where, where are my amens? Because, man, when we are cocky and judgmental, it doesn't look like our Lord. That is just, that is messed up. So, okay. Um, thankfully, none of you are like that. So, amen, right? Uh, the next word is gentle. And that is meekness under control. It's interesting. Uh, somebody asked me this. What would you do if you had one day to live? One day left, 24 hours. How are you going to spend it? And I was thinking, I'm fishing in Hawaii. That's what, that's what I'm doing. And then hanging out with my family, right? What did Jesus do when he had one day to live? He washed feet. Like, wait, what? He washed feet. And, and Luke 22 says that even during the Last Supper, the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. And then in that context, he's like, I'm washing your feet. Blew their minds. And then it blew their minds even more that that's the last thing he did. Whoa, crazy. The next one is patient, which means long-suffering and, uh, and having a long fuse. Very slow to anger is what that word means. And so I wanted to show you a little video because we, we fostered a puppy recently, and, uh, and this puppy would not leave my golden alone. And Gus, our golden, just had surgery, so he's got the cone of shame, and a puppy, like, in his face. So anyway, check, check this out. So, so literally, this little, this little puppy, we named him James for James Storehouse, but we didn't get to keep him. It was heartbreaking to foster this little guy and then let him go. But Gus was tolerant. Now, Gus could have eaten that dog. <laughs> really, one swallow, gone. But, but he decided to put up with the puppy. They actually became friends. So it was actually really cute how the puppy would sleep on his tail. And, he, and, he, and, and I felt like it was a great picture to us of patience when someone's annoying, when something is not right. When, that's what this word means, long-suffering, long-fuse. The last one is love which ties all of them together. So this is how we're living a, a worthy life. Um, and Colossians 3.14 says, above all these virtues, put on love that ties them all together. And, and 1 Corinthians uh, 13, if you don't have love, you ain't nothing, right? None of this other stuff matters. And it says, bearing with one another in love. And, and I believe that doesn't just mean tolerating someone who is annoying to you. Bearing with one another in love means accepting someone as your equal. It means caring about them as a creation of the Lord, part of the body of Christ that we belong with and are connected to. We're family. So does family ever bug you? Yeah, but you're still family. You love each other like crazy. That's, that's the picture. So speaking of unity, uh, without those things, without humility and gentleness, and patience and love, there is no real community. It's not possible. Um, so, so each of those things relies on self getting moved out of the center. So if I'm focused on my needs and my desires and my preferences and me, 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 these things matter most of all, guess what? Peace and unity is not going to be in my life. 
or it's going to be temporary because you're going to bug me and you're going to, you know, tick me off and you're going to what suddenly unity peace is snapped off because it's all about me. It's not my focus on us. And that has to change. And I feel like churches have have catered to people and taken care of their every need whenever possible so that it confirms and affirms, yes, it's all about you. And then when somebody bothers you at church, you're like, see? And then you leave or you have conflict or the unity is just divided because you feel like it's, we are all here for you and we're not. We're here for each other. We're here for the Lord. And so it's not my job to take care of your every need and turn the sound down if it's too loud and choose a different song for you and make sure that you know, everything's gluten-free. Uh, Right? That's weird. That would be weird if my job... My job is to help you grow, and my job is to help you do ministry in each other's lives, which is harder than the first one, but it's right. And at times, it'll be annoying, and you'll be like, man, I... I did. But that's how we grow. We grow together. We don't grow separate. Amen? Okay. Ephesians 4, 3 says, make every effort to keep the unity. That means check all the boxes. Do whatever you can to maintain unity. That doesn't mean you don't tell the truth. It doesn't mean that you're a doormat, but it means that unity is important to you, and you do your part, and you let God do the rest. So here's the thing. You can't create unity, but the Holy Spirit can. So unity is a reality in the Spirit, in the body of Christ. So it already exists. It's our job to maintain it. So how many of you have, have a garden? Would you raise your hand? Some of you have a garden and you're not raising your hand. I see, I see you. So, so I have a garden, and, uh, and I, I enjoy my garden. So here's a little picture. We have strawberries over on the left. We have watermelons, blueberries, blackberries in the back, tomatoes. Um, you can see a little pumpkin springing up there, some peppers, some other stuff. So anyway, I love being out in the garden. It grounds me. Get it? Um, but, but look at this. Look at this next, this next slide. So now we have some little elements in the garden. So these are pumpkins that, that I grew at the farm in Oxnard 12 years ago. I kept the, kept the seeds. They're still going. But the watermelon is bothering the pumpkins. So I have to keep moving the watermelon because the watermelon keeps getting in, in the pumpkin's business. And you'll notice there's a carrot up here who's kind of annoyed because these guys are not playing together nice. He doesn't have enough room to spread out. So let's look at, let's look at the next one. Oh, maybe that's the only one. So down at the bottom, you see weeds. How did this happen? I'm a good gardener. And look, weeds in my garden. Who put them in there? The fallen world we live in, right? If you look at Genesis, that's who Adam and Eve put them in there. So here's the thing. It takes effort. I can't make the stuff grow. But I can do my part to help it grow. And then God brings the growth. Actually, the Bible says that I don't make stuff grow, he does. So I can pull weeds, I can move the things around, and here in church I can say, you know, you two should spend a little less time together. <laughs> or, or I could say, you would be really good in this ministry, not in that one. Or you're not very good with kids. Let's try you with youth, right? So that, right? So we're, we're helping to, to cr- not create the unity, but protect it. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's look at the end of this. So Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, it says there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. One occurs seven times in these verses. What does seven signify? Do we have any smart people in the room? Completion. And notice we had seven walks in Ephesians, seven ones in Ephesians, And that is the picture of God saying, this is the complete idea. So there's one body. Uh, Unity is our reality. Um, Even if we face disagreements with each other. And in our church, one thing that I think is beautiful about Caneo Church is we don't agree on every aspect of theology. We have unity, but not uniformity. So some of you see a couple of end times events differently than I do. Some of you see certain aspects of our faith differently than I do. Some of you are more charismatic. Some of you are more fundy. 
Some of, you know, we have a lot of people that are from different backgrounds. And, and it's really cool that we get to coexist and have unity, but not uniformity. If you think differently on something, let's, let's sort that out. And if it's not a, a matter of gospel importance, and it usually isn't, we can get along and, and we can exist, because we're going to have to put up, put up with each other in heaven eventually, and we may as well start doing it now, right? There, there's an old joke that everybody was up in heaven walking around, they see this big 50-foot brick wall, and they're like, what is that about? They're asking St. Peter, and then he says, oh, the Baptists are on the other side, they think they're the only ones here. So it reminds me of the unity in the the unity in the body is for Caneo Church, yes. It's also for the the Christians, the believers in Christ in our valley, but it's also global. And it really grounds you. It, it, it helps you have a bigger framework if you travel the globe and you see believers all over the place. My dad and I got to travel in Uganda and Kenya and hang out with, with believers there, and they worship the Lord like crazy. We were three hours late to a conference, and, and we said, aren't you worried? And they said, oh, no, they'll just, they'll just keep worshiping, don't worry. Three hours. So literally, this like, leader's thing was six or seven hours long. They didn't even notice we were late. I, I remember being up in, uh, in Nepal with Christina and, uh, and enjoying the believers up there. We were, we were about um, 10 minutes from the border of Tibet in this little church building that you helped build and those shoes were all sitting outside. And it was just unbelievable to hang out with all of these Christians on the border of Tibet and worship the same Jesus together. It just blew my mind. And the unity that we experienced was, in a, in a way, more powerful than here right now. Unbelievable. Okay, let's move on. Uh, think, think about this picture. There are trillions of cells in your body. They are all part of one body. They are all working together with a, on a mutually shared life. That's you. And you are a little microcosm of what the body of Christ is supposed to be like. Okay, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, it says there's one spirit. That reminds me of the verse that says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There's one hope. Colossians 1 says, Christ in us is our hope of glory. There's one Lord, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? Remember that? The Shema? And then there's one faith. And that's what Ephesians is about. It's not separate for Jews and Gentiles. We are all together in this thing. There's one baptism, 1 Corinthians 12. We're all baptized by one spirit to form one body. And as humans, we have one God, we have one Father, but if you look globally, there's all kinds of confusion. And, and here's the thing. Jesus, the word says, is the exact representation of the Father. If I try to understand what the Father is like apart from Jesus, I will find little pictures of him that are convoluted by culture and tradition and all kinds of junk. So how do we reconcile that? Because God wants people to be saved. He wants people to know him. And I was looking at that um, in, in Scripture. Jeremiah 29 says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And 2 Peter 3 says, the Lord is not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So, so if somebody believes something and they're very sincere, it does, sincerity doesn't make something true. I, I believe that globally, if we look at world religions, if we look at the history of humanity, the history of of us. There, there has to be humility that we've talked about. There has to be faith that we talked about. And if somebody is seeking God on his terms and saying, God, I believe you exist. You made all this. Somebody else didn't make all this. I'm not going to worship some little, you know, an otter or a tree. I'm going to, I want to know you. And if somebody comes with humility and faith and says, God, help me to know you. I believe that God will meet with that person based on what his word says and woo them to himself, no matter what culture they're from, no matter what time they live in. And, and I believe that's true of our God and his love and his vast love. He's willing to give his son for us. That makes sense. Amen. Amen. So 
I want to ask the band to come back up, and we are thankful for you. But I want to ask you this question. When was the time when you felt most connected to the body of Christ, most connected to a church, most connected to a small group? And, and I, I reached out to Shannon and Rob last night, and I said, do you have a picture of your community group? They literally had a race to find the picture, and she won. So I got this picture in 40 seconds. I have never seen responsiveness. I'm expecting that kind of responsiveness from all of you. From No, I'm just kidding. That was remarkable. So, but, but just think, when was a time when you felt most connected, most loved, most unified with the body? For some of you, maybe it's been a long time in your life. Man, that was when I was a kid. That was 20 years ago. That was, I need that. Uh, maybe you're like, I've never experienced that, but, but I would like to. And, and I wanted to say, I hope that it's now. I hope that you can lean in to the, being part of the one body of Christ. Lean into what the Lord has for you and, and ask him to bless your willingness, your obedience, and saying, man, I want to be connected. Lord, help me be connected. And he will meet you there. So I want to ask three questions uh, of you, and then we're going we're gonna to take communion based on the, the verses. The first one is this. Are you leading a worthy life? That's kind of like, kind of makes you shudder, right? Woo! If, if you're standing before God and he says, are you leading a worthy life? Do you feel like he's, you know, pointing his finger at you in judgment? No. But how about this? How about if he's open arms saying, let's do this together? And so for some of you, that means leading, leaving a habit behind, leaving some sin behind, because you're like, man, I am not leading a worthy life. I'm not worthy of my heavenly calling. No way, but I want to be. And, and as Sophia, my niece, said up here, don't start from where you wish you were. Start from where you are. Be real and just say, Lord, I, wa I want to lead a worthy life. The second one is this. Do you feel like you're better at preserving unity or tearing it apart? And man, when we went through the, the pandemic and, and all that stuff, there were some Christians that were really good at tearing stuff apart. There were some non-Christians who were really good at tearing stuff apart. And I want to, it doesn't, again, I'm not saying you're not truthful. I'm saying gentle, humble, loving. These things matter. Patience matters. So how we say something is just as important, sometimes more important than what we say. But Maybe the Lord wants to speak to a couple of you about that, about don't be a person who tears. Be a person who builds. Build the truth and do it his way. Right on? And then the last one is this. How connected are you right now to the body of Christ? Daily. Weekly. Because I meet people all the time and they're like, yeah, Canal Church is my church. I haven't seen them in a year. And then, and then they're like, yeah, I'd watch online. And I'm like, okay, what have we been talking about lately? They have no idea. There, there's this intention, right? Somebody once said the pathway to hell is paved with good intention. That's kind of scary, but I think it's kind of true. So ask yourself, how connected am I? How connected should I be? Weekly, daily, to each other. And that's invitation from Lord. It's not a guilt trip. It's a way of living life that's full and unified and where you get to serve and love others and they get to serve and love you. And here's the cool thing that happens when you go through hard stuff. How many of you have ever been through a hard thing in your life? Would you raise your hand? Some of you didn't raise your hand. That's funny. So when you go through hard stuff, you will need each other. And it's better to find those people now before you need them. Amen? So I want to say a prayer, and then I will lead us into communion. Uh, so Lord Jesus, I ask that you would help us to see our state before you, our condition before you. And, and Lord, some of us have not been leading worthy lives, and we just say, Lord, help me to take my next step. I give up this. I, I leave this stuff behind. Uh, Lord, I want to be worthy of you. Lord, some of us have been cantankerous and mean, and Lord, I ask that you would break that spirit of divisiveness and judgmentalism in us. Make us new in you, Jesus. Make us more like you. And Lord, some of us have been disconnected from your body, and we just say, I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't get it. 
but now I want to be part of a body of believers. I want to be connected to your family. I want to be part of this unity that you're creating. Lord, please welcome me in and help me to love and serve those people around me. And I ask that in Jesus' name. And everybody in the place and online said, amen. We went through some Ephesians pretty fast.